Good evening. I'm Ann Leonard, Manton Curator of Prints, Drawings, and Photographs at the Clark Art Institute, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our Clark Connects event with Professor Ava Leia Burkhardt. She's joining us tonight as part of the programming for Lines from Life, French Drawings from the Diamond Collection, a splendid exhibition organized by former curatorial assistant for works on paper, Christy Kuzer. Lines from Life features a diverse array of figural drawings from 19th century France and celebrates the vision and generosity of collectors Herbert and Carol Diamond, whom we are honored to call longtime friends of the Clark, and whose ongoing gifts will continue to enrich the museum well after the exhibition closes a week from this Sunday on December 13th. Thank you, Herb and Carol. The wonder of drawings, as these collectors know, is in their domestic scale, their intimacy and immediacy, and that is the kind of experience we will be able to return to again post-pandemic in the Clark's Manton Study Center for Works on Paper. So it's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Ava Lyer Burkhart is the William Dorr Boardman Professor of Fine Arts at Harvard University, where she has taught since 1992. She specializes in 18th and 19th century French art and has also written extensively on contemporary art. She has a half dozen books to her name, but for tonight, I will single out for special mention, Drawing, the Invention of a Modern Medium, which is the catalog of an exhibition she co-curated with Elizabeth Rudy at the Harvard Art Museums in 2017. Professor Lyra Burkhardt's scholarship encompasses the medium and materiality of drawings as well as topics including gender and the body. So you can see why she came immediately to mind when we first began thinking about speakers for tonight's events. And on a personal note, I want to say that I was first enraptured by a Professor Lyra Burkhardt lecture as a beginning graduate student more than 20 years ago, which is why it is a special honor for me to welcome her to our virtual podium tonight. Before we get underway, just a reminder about the mechanics of Q&A in a Zoom webinar. As you may be familiar with from prior webinars, all attendees are muted and the chat function is disabled. However, you are welcome to submit questions at any point using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. At the end of the presentation, we will respond to as many questions as we have time for. So thank you again for joining us this evening. And now, Professor Lyra Burkhardt. Thank you very much, Anne, for this kind introduction um, and uh, for the invitation uh, to the Clark um, to speak on one of my favorite topics, uh, drawing. Uh, I wish it were in person, um, that's always better, but on the other hand, one cannot have it all. So um, um, uh, we will uh, proceed virtually. Okay, so let us begin. One of the most striking drawings in the Diamond Collection currently on show at the Clark is Jean-Francois Raphaëli's uh, Man in the Outskirts of the City. Although now little known, if not entirely forgotten, Raphaëli was in his time a critically acclaimed painter, sculptor, and printmaker who exhibited his work at the two independent Impressionist exhibitions of 1880 and 1881. The outskirts of the drawing's title refers to Anières, where the artist moved in 1878. A short train ride from Paris, Anières um, exemplified a rapidly developing territory of suburbia where the leisure seeking bourgeois escaped from the city on weekends. It was as a site of leisure that the banlieue was painted by the Impressionists and later by Seurat, whose 1884 bathers in Anières represented a proletarian version of the subject. Raphaëli's vision of the banlieue differed from both the Impressionists and Seurat, however. It was a desolate realm populated by drifters, rack pickers, absinthe drinkers, 
um, as in this canvas of 1880-81, and, and other déclassé characters living from hand to mouth. Shown standing unoccupied by a rickety fence, an anemic landscape spreading behind him, the man in the drawing resembles such characters as the garlic seller painted by Raffaelli about the same time, it too fe featuring the same rickety fence. What distinguishes the drawing though, aside from the fact that the protagonist is shown doing nothing, is the vivid chroma of the man's clothes, especially the acid yellow of his pants, the color of urban decadence that reminds one of uh, the Parisian Café Concert rendered by his colleague Degas, and of course later by Toulouse-Lautrec. Raphael's use of this striking color makes his realism of the suburbs at once appealing and strange. The artist, in fact, once spoke of the strangeness of Anier. Raphael's remarkable drawing exemplifies the basic uh, aspects shared by all drawings in the Clark exhibition, namely their focus on the human figure. The exhibition offers us a gallery full of bodies of different kind, from the idealized female nudes to the working body performing a specific task, from the bodies of Arabs seated on the ground to that of a Renaissance Florentine poet spread out on a stone ledge. As such, the exhibition testifies to the characteristic aspect of French art, its consistent engagement with and privilege of the human figure. This aesthetic predominance of the body has much to do with the central role of drawing from live model in French artistic tradition. From its very beginning, drawing was conceived uh, of as a medium inseparable from the model. According to the myth of its origins, drawing was invented by a Corinthian maid, Dibutadis, who, facing the imminent departure of her lover, traced his contours on the wall. The subject was especially popular in the 18th century as exemplified by this Joseph Wright of Derby's The Corinthian Maid of 1782-84. It was as a means of capturing the human form that drawing served as the basis of artistic training, notably in the Italian Renaissance. In France, this use of drawing was put into practice by the Academy. Founded in 1648 under the auspices of the King Louis XIV, the Academy Royale became an institution that shaped French artistic culture for at least two centuries by introducing the first systematic drawing-based approach to artistic instruction. The distinct stages of this long process of instruction are represented through groups of students of different ages featured in Charles-Nicolas Cochin's illustration for the entry on, on, on drawing in the Encyclopédie. One started early at the age of seven or eight by copying prints and drawings of the old masters as the group of children on the extreme left here um, illustrates. Then moving on to copying plaster casts of bodily fragments or la bosse, which is featured here on the wall, an approach that echoed in um, the artist's habit of studying bodily parts as did Degas in his drawing in the diamond collection. The next stage, uh, was the drawing of the whole human figure from sculpture, the group of youths here next to the young children and also uh, here on the extreme right. And only after that was one allowed to move on to drawing from a live model posed in the center left of Cochin's uh, vignette here under a lamp, by which time one was already in one's early 20s. A special room was dedicated for that purpose, as you can see here in the plan at the Academy with benches arranges, arranged in, a, in an amphitheater around uh, the podium where the model was uh, posed. And here is the buckets to catch the wax uh, uh, dripping from the lamp. 
The drawing from the light model was called an Académie, a metonymic reference to the institution of training, uh, and it involved a meticulous rendition of the anatomy, save for the genitals, especially the muscles. Here you're looking at the Fanlo and Bouchardon academies, respectively. The models were exclusively male, and so were the students. Academy was a male territory. Women were not admitted to life classes on the grounds of impropriety. The exposure to the male nude was seen to pose a potential threat to their modesty. A view of Jacques-Louis David's studio as an exclusively male enclave illustrates the point. David, by the way, did train some female artists, but separately from men in the room on a different floor. Women who did not gain access to, the, to academic training until 1888 received drawing instruction in private studios, as Marie Bershkirtsev's uh, 1881 painting on your right illustrates. The female model had no place in the official academic pedagogy. The only women allowed within the walls of Academy's classroom were hand and face models. Um, the drawing on the left, illustrating a competition for the expressive head introduced in 1760 by, by Comte de Quelus, an influential collector, connoisseur, and an honorary member of the Academy, indeed features a woman posing for the competition, her body thoroughly covered as she models only her head. Otherwise, all professors and students were male. On the right, an example of the academic head study produced in her own studio by Elisabeth Vigée-Lebrun, an 18th century painter who was admitted to the academy <clears throat> as, only, um, as one of only four members uh, allowed um, to, to become members of the institution at the time. The academic membership still not granting these women access to training or teaching in the institution. Cochin's illustration of the uh, modest female model who bows her head and covers her face with her hand, a fig leaf covering her pubis, conveys the idea of the basic inappropriateness of woman as a model for academic art. The implication of the image is that any woman willing to pose uh, nude before a male artist was by definition morally suspect. Uh, yet female models did pose for male artists in the 18th century, though only in the privacy of the studio. A painting called The Private Academy, most likely a copy after Gabriel de Saint-Aubin's original now now at the Frick Collection in New York, represents this practice as a situation ripe with sexual implications evoked by the quasi-ecstatic uh, pose of the nude model and by the subject of the painting standing on an easel in the background featuring a satyr, um, a satyr accosting a sleeping nymph. The 19th century inherited the ideological construction of the female model as immodest or vulgar. As a profession, modeling was, moreover, as Susan Waller's study on the subject has demonstrated, hard for women to practice. Female model continued to be prohibited in the Ecole des Beaux-Arts until 1863, and though women continued to pose in the private teaching ateliers, they were hired and paid by a session rather than being steadily employed as were their male counterparts. As a fixture of the artist's studio, the female model became a popular cultural trope in the 19th century, being featured in both visual and literary representations. The romantic studio was a site of sexual encounter and or romance. Adrienne Ampierre's de Verzi, um, de Verzi's 1836 depiction of Abel Pujol's studio is an unusual example of this iconography in that while the artist emphasized the domestic, even intimate character of this, of this interior, note the sofa, the table and chairs uh, in the background, 
the posing session with the half nude female model as depicted um, is depicted as entirely professional and chaste situation with no hints at any romantic or erotic involvement between the model and the painter. This virtuous vision of the artist model relation may have uh, something to do with the fact that it was painted by a female artist. The works of uh, William Bouguereau and uh, Octave Tasser in the Clark uh, exhibition illustrate two radically different approaches to life drawing after the, after female, uh, the female model, marking the antipodes of the artistic vision of the female body in the 19th century. A female version of the Academy, Bouguereau's drawing perpetuates the, uh, on your left, perpetuates the academic tradition of, of the idealized body, uh, female bodies such as this having been used for allegories or mythological uh, compositions. Despite the systematic derision, such practice was greeted with at the time by the realist critics, such as Torre Burger or Castagnari. Tasser, on the other hand, offers an, an, an adulterated vision of a specific body of a model seated, undressed, and somewhat uncomfortably on a chair, her bonnet still on her head. She seems to have walked into the studio uh, from the street, hastily undressed, and forgetting to remove her hat, sat on the chair to pose for the artist. The drawing registers her posing as much as the model herself. Berthe Morisot's uh, half-figure rendition of a young woman, on the other hand, documents the painter's frequent practice of resorting to unprofessional models, such as the daughter of the concierge in the house on uh, Rue Villejuste, where Morisot's family moved in 1883. Uh, her name was Marthe uh, Givaudan, featured here. Parenthetically, I would mention an alternative to the model that uh, artists often used, especially for women and continued to use throughout the 19th century, namely a lay figure or uh, otherwise called a mannequin. Uh, mannequin. Chardin, whose uh, painting you are looking at on, um, on the right, the attentive nurse um, in the National Gallery in uh, Washington. Um, Chardin, who, um, has not received sufficient training in drawing, and he really didn't uh, draw at all, almost at all in his, in his career, um, is known to have used routinely a mannequin, uh, such as the one I'm showing you on the left, whose uh, dress could be adjusted. Um, it could function as a, as, a, as, a fig as a male or female figure. Another typically 19th century alternative for the work um, uh, was to work with uh, photography instead of live model, um, as notably um, Delacroix uh, did. Although I didn't bring a slide for that. So, if, uh, approaches to no. the model. Yeah, go ahead. I wonder if we could um, uh, pause just for a question because you um, <laughs> let me get my video on. I, here we are. I wonder, um, you mentioned women's access to models being so restricted um, in the academic system. And I just wonder what, how, how did they learn to draw the figure? In other words, what, what materials were available to them? Were they working most often from copy books or prints or other um, prior models rather than the live model most of all, or what, what options were available? Well, judging, it's a very good question. Judging from um, what we know, for example, um, Vigée Lebrun's um, allegory of peace uh, bringing in abundance, which actually gained her the entry to the academy, um, includes nudity, and she clearly must have worked from a nude model, um, which she probably did privately in a private studio. Um, so that was one option. Another, and I'm glad you have mentioned it, is of course to use um, drawing manuals, which were you know, vastly popular since the Renaissance, 
uh, but acquired a new level of popularity in the 18th century because of publication uh, such as Jean Bert, uh, where not only illustrations, but also uh, a discussion of them was included. So it was more than just a kind of model book that would, use, would be used by craftsmen, but more of a learning tool for artists who, um, who were, you know, uh, aspiring to a, a higher aesthetic uh, level, as it were. So this is what you could do to, you know, train yourself in, in drawing, especially bodily parts and generally the proportions of the body initially. But if you wanted to paint a body as did Vigil Lebrun for a major work, you would need to hire a model, you know, in a private situation. Um, but what female artists lacked and for all the non-academic artists also lacked um, was a kind of exposure for years on end to live model, you know, uh, with sessions um, twice a week in late afternoon, which kind of instilled in one the bodily form, a live bodily form. And when I said non-academic... I'm sorry, what? I was going to say, I imagine that also had huge consequences for their opportunities for the important commissions, which of course were the history paintings and the mythological and biblical subjects that were built around the figure. Exactly, exactly. That's, that's it. You know, um, the Guild School, the uh, Academy of St. Luke, had also um, intermittently uh, um, been authorized to pose a live model, but it lost these privileges and its history is, is complicated to recall here now. This just to say that there were other possibilities, but they were not as you know, sustained and as important as the Academy. That's why you know, Academy had such importance uh, for, for French artistic tradition. Yeah. Whoever wanted to be an artist, um, and uh, whoever was lucky enough to be a man, um, you know, who would have to go through the academy to enter, uh, you know, the, the world uh, of um, the artistic arena that, that mattered. Yes, indeed. That's wonderful. All right. Let's move on. This is wonderful. Okay. So, medium and modernity. Changing approaches to the model must, of course, be situated in a large context of the evolving conception, uses and functions of drawing as a medium, and given our chronological focus, in particular, its modernity. The roots of drawing's transformation into a modern medium may be traced back to the Renaissance, as just about everything else can, when technological improvements in the production of paper made it more widely available and affordable for the artists. In the course of the 15th and 16th centuries, um, as paper sheets gradually replaced reusable wooden tablets and parchment, drawing began to acquire a new function and meaning. Easier to use and less costly than other supports, paper allowed for the development of the practice of sketching. Artists began to use drawing as the means of thinking through their ideas of experimentation and research rather than only purpose-driven preparation for a specific work. Drawing became inseparable from the creative process, at once its instrument and its material record. Parallel to this new development was the Renaissance reconceptualization of drawing as an intellectual activity epitomized by the notion of disegno. As Giorgio Vasari conceived of it, disegno rather than uh, a merely mimetic tool was the principle of understanding forms. In Avico's uh, engraving the Academy of Baccio Bandinelli of 1544 testifies to this new conception of drawing by showing the young draftsman's manual activity as inseparable from the mental process of uh, reflection. Note the figure seated by the fireplace immersed, immersed in, in deep thought. By the way, most of them are still using tablets to, to draw on, which you would have to erase if you wanted to reuse it. Therefore, you could never use a tablet to you know, uh, record your um, creative process or your ideas. 
The most significant transformation of drawing occurred in the 18th century when, it, uh, when its um, practice, status, understanding and uses were extended in scope and radically redefined. This is when drawing left the narrow confines of the artist's workshop or studio to enter into an expanded field of discourse, culture, politics and social life at large. In addition to becoming the cornerstone of artistic education at the Academy, drawing came to be recognized as a work of art unto itself, an object that was avidly collected, discussed and exhibited. One symptom of uh, the recognition of drawing as an independent form of expression was the inclusion of the work, um, the works on paper in the Salon exhibition. Uh, exhibitions, an annual, later biennial public display of art that became regular from 1737 onwards. In Gabriel de Saint-Aubin's view of the Salon of 1767, drawings can be seen pinned to the green, um, um, well, I see, I cannot um, zoom, um, uh, to this, uh, uh, green drapery covering uh, the tables in the center right uh, here uh, and on the extreme left of the image and I think I have that uh, detail uh, here where they're being examined up close by the visitors among them a man holding a magnifying glass. Critics urged artists to pull drawings from the obscurity of their portfolios and exhibit them at the Salon. Later on, public exhibitions dedicated specifically to drawings also took place. In 1797, in the wake of the revolution, a remarkable exhibition of drawings from the royal collection was staged to celebrate the recuperation of the king's private possession as national patrimony. Constantin Bourgeois's view of the Galerie d'Apollon at the Louvre, where the exhibition took place, makes evident the organizer's recognition of the challenge involved in exhibiting drawings as opposed to paintings and the presence of mirrors at the, um, uh, uh, and their effort to enhance the viewer's experience of them by the low hang of the smaller objects um, uh, here and the presence of mirrors in the end of the gallery to provide more light attests. Through such public displays, drawing entered the social sphere of collective experience, commentary and debate. The social visibility of drawing was also enhanced by the burgeoning art market where works on paper figured prominently, especially in the second half of the 18th century. Circulating in the commercial context, dealers, galleries, auctions and inventory sales, drawing became a commodity its status and meaning as a market, marketable object being defined by the discourse generated by these venues. Such was the role of the sales catalogs in particular, um, and in particular the um, catalog raisonné invented by uh, the art dealer Edme Gersin. Combining the legal format of an inventory with the intellectual ambition of a scientific publication, the catalog raisonné adopted and refined the categories of identification and description of the works of art developed in connoisseurship. The empirically visually based method of studying drawing developed in this period for commercial purposes. A cochin pairs frontispiece to Gersin's catalog for the 1744 posthumous uh, sale of uh, Louis Quentin de la Lorangère uh, collection of art and curiosities, which included a substantial amount of prints and drawings, makes clear uh, this um, kind of publication sought to determine not only the value of the objects, but also their social and cultural meaning. So in other words, this is, I'm talking here about two different kinds of publication, the catalog raisonné that I'm not showing you and the sale catalog, which you are looking at here. By featuring connoisseurs and amateurs gathered around uh, a table to peruse and discuss works on paper pulled uh, out of their portfolios, the frontispiece presents drawing not only as a commodity uh, on sale, but also an object of collective appreciation a catalyst of a certain form of elite sociability 
and an instrument of taste formation. The social circulation and visibility of drawing was also in unprecedented way expanded by collecting practices. Some of the most significant private collections of drawings were formed in the 18th century. They comprise not only the works of the old masters, exemplified by the extraordinary holdings of Pierre Crozat, but also, and this was new, of the living artists, Boucher and Fragonard among them. Some of these private collections were moreover made accessible to the visitors, artists, amateurs, and foreign travelers, thus generating a wider interest in drawing. An important early collector, Jean de Julien, uh, even commissioned a visitor's guide for his famous cabinet housed in his hotel on Rue de Gobelin in Paris, featuring watercolor renditions of elevations complete with the thumbnail images of framed drawings interspersed with paintings on the gallery walls. Here are the two pastels on this particular wall. These diverse phenomena lay the ground for the functioning of drawing in the 19th century, when the development of new reproductive technologies heightened its social circulation. The Goncourt brothers were avid collectors of 18th century drawings, amassing a collection of 600 works by various artists. Here is Edmond de Goncourt in his study with what most likely are drawings and prints packed here in the lower sh uh, shell. Another collector of drawings, a notable collector of drawings, was Edgar Degas. One can certainly make the connection between the entry of drawing into the social sphere and the use of the medium to represent the parts of society that have not been previously represented. Before Raffaelli installed himself in the banlieue to become its painter and uh, draftsman, Millet, um, Jean-François Millet, went to the rural area of Barbizon and Normandy to represent their peasant population. They were not the first artists who immersed their practice in the society at large, enough to think of uh, Watteau drawing the Savoyards in the, on the Parisian street, as you see here, but the decision to install themselves elsewhere, to live where they drew and painted uh, was new. What I mean is that their own bodily, not only aesthetic or ideological commitment to a territory of artistic exploration, their decision to dwell in it, to immerse both their practice and themselves in a place is novel and signals um, the social immersion of drawing as a medium uh, on yet another level. Um, so I'll, I'll come back and maybe interject another question. Um, so it seems that the, the, there's a complex social dynamic going on with the artists who are in a sense revealing new, new publics, as you said at the, um, at the end of that section in the 19th century. Um, and then a public of collectors who remain very much urban uh and connected with the structures of the market and the exhibition hall and the salon and so on which is remains a very parisian based phenomenon so i'm interested in the sort of uh crossover um or or the artist as a kind of midpoint intermediary mm. between these sectors of society that have have been hidden in let's say in the, mostly in the 18th century, and then, and then the new uh, public of collectors. And how how is that how is that mediated? And do you think drawings, because of their portability and other reasons, have a have a special role to play there? Absolutely, I think you you put your finger uh, on a key point that um, um, precisely because the portability, um, and you know, also one would say. Uh, you know, uh, relative inexpensiveness compared to paintings of contemporary artists, um, uh, not of old masters. Drawings had a key role in that installment of a completely, um, of a kind of life that was invisible practically, right? 
mm -hmm. um, in the uh, bourgeois dwellings uh, mm -hmm. in Paris. So I, th I think this is a very, very important point and I will return to it at the end of, uh, of the talk. So thank you for yeah. Yeah. making it. And if, and if I could ask also, because it, it just occurs to me, um, I mean, occurs to me as well that the, I can find my question. Oh, the question about drawings that are made um, as finished products. And th this, I think, um, when you spoke about this rise of a, of a collecting connoisseurial public um, and, and the interest in, in um, draw drawings as a finished product rather than as preparatory to something else. I think that's a question that many visitors have who come to an exhibition such as the, the Lines from Life is, to what extent were these drawings intended originally to be put on a put on a wall um, and admired as such, or to what extent are they preparatory and we've sort of snatched this glimpse of, at a creative process that normally would be would be hidden um, to a museum visitor. And so I, I, I'm just interested, and maybe you'll get to it in in what comes. But it, it, there seems to be a mix of those categories in, in the Diamonds exhibition, which I think is partly what makes it so fascinating, um, uh, this mix of preparatory mm -hmm. works as well as finished. Right, right. And this process sort of evolves while the, say, early <laughs> moment, uh, I mean, drawings were collected before the 18th century, but there were drawings of particular artists, usually from the past, almost never contemporary artists. Um, whose drawings were considered their own business, their preparatory, you know, uh, um, uh, tools. Um, in the 18th century, these preparatory tools began to be collected, but to a much lesser extent, the drawings that were fairly finished. And, you know, there are people like Boucher who are actually circulating drawings that are preparatory and even having his students helping him out with them and that's just signing off on them to uh, generate a huge amount of such um, drawings as commodities. Um, but what is definitely uh, much uh, more often collected are, you know, what Desalier d'Angerville called the dessin arrêté, that is the finished drawings. Whereas in the 18th century, I think that uh, people began to be more open to the drawing as a document of artistic process. And someone, especially someone like Degas, who is an artist collector, looks for it. He goes to, you know, artists, posthumous sales and buys things uh, and also buys things from the past. That's the so, example of the, the artist as draftsman and, and collector playing the dual role. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. okay, so techniques of the body. Shifting our attention. Uh, oh, and not quite. Shifting our attention to the technical and material dimensions of Millet and Raffaelli's respective works, let us note that the most salient um, aspect, the monochromatic density of the thickly contoured figures of rural laborers in one, and the chromatic vivacity of the inhabitant of the suburbia in the other, signal the transformation of the material basis of drawing in the 19th century. One significant um, development, um, I can stay with that. One significant development was the availability of new artistic materials such as Comte Crayon, with which Millet works here, a medium invented in the end of the 18th century, but more common in the 19th. And um, secondly, synthetic colors, first in, invented in the mid 19th century. Another 19th century phenomenon was the increasingly frequent cross-pollination of drawing with new visual technologies that resulted in a rematerialization and reinvention of the medium. Before the 19th century, the most common medium used for live drawing was red chalk, as you have already seen. It's used by artists, goes back at least to the Renaissance. Leonardo uh, was credited with introducing it. Uh, here is what is taken to be his self-portrait in red chalk. 
but it made, uh, but it became most popular in the 18th century when the Academy adopted it for the purpose of artistic instruction, the academies. Um, they were predominantly done, executed in red chalk. It was a natural red chalk or hematite. It came in large pieces that had to be cut with uh, a special little saw or a knife made for that purpose and fitted in a, in a, into a porte uh, crayon or a chalk holder before uh, use. Here you see it in the, in the lower part. The chalk came in a great range of tones, which could be modified by handling with stump or uh, water. Here I show you a contemporary darker um, uh, red, uh, red chalk. In the hands of able draftsmen, such as Jean-Baptiste Greuze, um, this is a study likely for a Caritas Romana subject now at the uh, Harvard Art Museum. It produced various inflected strokes of varied in intensity. The key aspect of the medium was its redness associated with blood as the French term for it, sanguine or sanguine in English indicates, which is what made it so suitable for the representation of the living body. Another advantage was it, that it could be easily counterproofed. Artists used it to copy their drawings, either to prepare them for print, the counterproof would have the image in reverse, that is uh, the same direction as the print, and thus serve as a good guide for the printer, or else uh, to keep record of their work. The disadvantage was that it smudged is easily and dirtied one's clothes. When the natural hematite became hard to access, red chalk was replaced by other materials. Later, artificial red chalk was introduced, but in the 19th century, the medium lost its prominence. Black chalk, another common drawing tool was harder and uh, lacked color that, sang that Sanguine was so appreciated for in the rendition of the body. But these were precisely the qualities that the neoclassical artists, chief among them Jacques-Louis David, appreciated as his exquisite study for Camille, for his painting Oath of the Horatia in black chalk highlighted in white on beige paper attests. David's famous pupil, however, Angre. Oh, I lost him. Never mind. Um, but there is a drawing of his in the exhibition. Uh, Angre was, as he put it, raised in, raised in red chalk. His father trained him. Used mostly graphite, another alternative to red chalk. It afforded thinner lines and was a tool of precision that Angra cherished. And you can see it in his um, drawing of what likely is one of the preparatory studies for his painting of um, Dante Bay's painting of Paolo and uh, Francesca in the exhibition. Black chalk was softer and more pliant than graphite. And as both 19th century artists, Alexandre Cabanels and Isidore Pierce's work illustrate, um, uh, with skillful use, one could obtain varied uh, textures and uh, chromatic effects. Thus, Cabanel was able to render the pool of the soft stockings worn by his reclining figure, unfortunately, in this version, I can't zoom up, but you can see those folds of soft stockings. Um, sorry about that. Um, and uh, um, on the right in Pils, not that uh, the masterful modeling of the man's head, his shaped, uh, his shaded face sculpted um, by the rhythmic, rhythmic strokes of varying intensity the shaved top of his skull and his neck rendered with lighter and sparser hatchings and highlighted in white chalk. And finally, the, his remarkable tuft of dark hair punctuated by areas of deeper black, perhaps touches of charcoal, I'm not sure. It's not 
a medium listed in the description of the drawing, but it looks uh, very, very soft. Um, or else more strongly applied um, or softer black chalk. The drawing may have been done while the artist traveled with uh, the French troops during the Crimean War in the mid 1850s. The man's hairstyle resembles, in my view, those worn by Cossacks at the time. Let us note, however, that while masterful, this orientalizing, orientalizing presentation of the man's head is also slightly disturbing, his body being shown from the back and from a slightly elevated point of view as if it were an ethnographic specimen being submitted to for the viewer's um, inspection. Charcoal, a medium with a uh, long history um, going back to the prehistoric cave drawings where it was used, is a natural material made of burnt wood. There are different kinds of charcoal, uh, for example, vine charcoal, a thin stick made by burning grape vines in Erlis kiln. Here you are looking at, at it. Um, or willow charcoal made in the same way. Uh, or compressed charcoal formed into a stick with binders, which is what you are seeing here on the right. It is friable medium and rubs off easily from its support, but it can be fixed. There was a revival of charcoal in the 19th century by the realist artists, in particular, Francois Morvin's drawing in the diamond collection, the interior of the tavern of 1866, exemplifies the innovative use of charcoal that marked this revival. Working from dark to light, Bonvin obtains a tonal effect that conveys the atmosphere of a tavern interior where the two figures are shown relaxing in the evening, drinking and smoking. Note the woman's remarkably long pipe. Rather than using hatchings, as did Peels, working uh, with black chalk, Bonvin rubs his charcoal stick against the grain of the paper, uh, activating its texture to produce effects of uh, chiaroscuro, um, the paper, in other words, the paper's texture, as you can see here, especially in the back, in the wall, um, the, the paper's texture itself contributes to the representation of the un unevenly illuminated wall in this uh, interior. One of the initiators of this method of working from dark to light was Gustave Courbet whose artist at an easel of 1847-48, uh, now at the Harvard Art Museum collections, epitomizes this approach. The artist represents himself in his evidently cold studio, wearing a checkered house coat, matching pants, and a sleeping cap on his head. Particularly interesting uh, is his mode of rendering these sartorial details that involved modeling by subtraction, a procedure called arrachage in French. Having entirely covered the sheet with charcoal, Courbet used an eraser, stale bread rolled into a bowl often served this purpose, though by the 18th century rubber was also used, to create forms and patterns by removing the particles of the medium from the surface. You can see this um, here, especially, and in the cap where either he removed too much or else it got abraded later on. As Petra Tendushate Chu has argued, this new tonal style of drawing, the Saint de Fe, first witnessed in the work of some of the Romantic artists and later more fully embraced by the realists, such as Courbet and Bonvin may be attributed to these artists' emulation of the new printing techniques, especially lithography, which, though invented in 1796, became widely popular only about 1815, ceding only to the new photomechanical procedures that emerged in the 1860s. But one could say that it was not only lithography, but also intaglio printing that served as a model in these artists' technical innovations. Courbet's method of subtraction for one seems closer to an engraver's incisive touch that, than, that to, uh, than that of lithographers that does not cut into the limestone uh, surface. 
Moreover, but moreover, by proceeding from dark to light and thus reversing the traditional operations of drawing that consist in depositing dark marks on a blank surface, both Courbet and Bonvin may be seen to emulate the way in which an intaglio printer creates the matrix of the image by covering the plate with ink and then wiping it out to expose the incised lines. In other words, proceeding from dark to light. But perhaps emulation is not the most adequate terms, term for describing the uh, complex um, relation between the practice of drawing and the new visual technologies of the image in the 19th century. Nothing, ma nothing makes this complex, the complexity of this relation more clearly evident than the work of Georges Seurat. An excellent draftsman, um, Seurat had a total command of the traditional drawing technique taught at the Academy as his early drawing of Mayo Nude attests. But he developed his own highly idiosyncratic approach to the medium. His Café Concert of 1887, a representation of the Parisian equivalent of a musical, music hall, a subject popular with his older contemporaries, notably Degas, um, illustrates his unusual methods. Um, Seurat adopts Degas', Degas point of view, um, casting his, uh, the, what I'm showing you is Degas um, at the Café Concert Les Ambassadeurs of 1875-77, uh, casting his look at the singer on stage from the orchestra pit below. But he forgoes Degas' colors and varied textures in favor of a uniform black and white treatment of the page. He's using a Conté crayon, a medium that was introduced in France in the end of the 18th century and consisted of a pulverized and compressed graphite, later synthesized chalk pigments, combined with clay as a binder. His support is most often a highly textured Michelet paper. Moving his uh, Conté crayon across the grainy sheet of paper, the draftsman hand produces a quasi mechanical effect uh, of an even coated, tonally modulated surface. Only the denser spots of white gouache marking the lights, some lining the stage, others illuminating it from above, interrupt this even surface, producing what one scholar described as a sense of luminosity rooted in materiality. Both the quasi-mechanical dimension of Seurat's technique and its restrained, resolutely black and white chroma obviously evoke photography. Charles Rötlinger's portrait of one of the most famous café concert singers, Teresa of 1867, exemplifies the widely circulated photographic imagery with which Seurat grew up. Portraits such as these were produced by a contact printing of the collodion-covered glass negative on albumen coated printing paper, a process invented in 1850s. Due to its relative simplicity and inexpensiveness, this process made possible the commercial uh, spread of photography, notoriously dubbed the industrial madness by Baudelaire. Seurat's treatment of the page and the effect it creates, his skin-like image appearing as if it were a result of mechanical surface-to-surface -surface contact, evokes this photographic process. But unlike photography, Seurat's drawing obliterates as much as it registers appearances. Ghost-like, Seurat's figures um, lack anatomical and physiognomic presence. It is as if the substance of the self was sucked out in the process of representation. What do we make of it? I would suggest that Seurat's no doubt self-conscious evocation of photography was not simply emulative, nor was his practice merely homologous to photography. Rather, his oblique engagement with the medium seems to me to have been competitive and laced with ambivalence registered in the abstracted bodily appearance and subjective evacuation of his figures. Severa's preparatory studies for his most important painting, Sunday Afternoon at the Grand Jatte, epitomize this subjective dispossession. I'm showing you a study for the figure of the child holding her nanny's hand here at the center of the composition. 
If in the painting, the girl's features are residually marked, you can't actually see it, but her eyes are marked. If I had my, ah, I do have my zoom, sadly. Okay, so you can see these eyes in the painting. In the drawing, the physiognomy is entirely wiped out. There is not even an outline of the face, though you can feel its presence somehow in the amorphic shadow under the girl's hat. Both the subjective evacuation and mechanized appearance of the Grand Jatte characters and the abstracting mode of representation in drawing have been seen as a social commentary on life in Paris in the era of spectacle. But uh, Seurat's representational strategy should also be recognized as a commentary on what it meant to be an artist working under the new conditions defined by the commercial spread of photography. The uninhibited circulation of a reproducible image that offered an enhanced, unmatchable reality effect exerted pressure on the manual medium, such as drawing, and this affected the nature, goals, and effects of aesthetic and technical experimentation. There was as much curiosity and interest in photography as there was anxiety about it among the artists. The symptoms of both attitude, uh, attitudes is what we detected in Seurat's innovative approach to drawing. The artist responds to these conditions by both simulating and subtly sabotaging the effect of photography as a medium, retaining its tonal qualities, but refusing its mimetic truth and its identificatory effects. One may say that Seurat self-consciously sought to transform his medium into photography à rebours. Seurat's friend and uh, fellow um, uh, neo-impressionist Charles uh, Ingrand uses similar materials as Seurat, but to different effects. And his drawing, uh, as his drawing in the exhibition, The Seamstresses of 1880, a subject representing uh, what was then considered a typically feminine occupation and engaged as such by Seurat in the portrait of his mother on the left, indicates Ingrand is less preoccupied with the medium of photography than with reinventing realist iconography in a different medium. His use of Comte crayon may be compared to Bonvin's deployment of charcoal. The artist's goal in the seamstresses is, um, is similar to provide a tangible sense of the atmosphere of the darkened interior by giving a material substance to the shadows against which the silhouettes of the woman working by the lamp appear. The difference lies in Angan's self-conscious signaling of his means. The palpable traces of his crayon, unlike the invisible marks of charcoal in the Bonvin, creating a mediating screen of his craft through which we are invited to look at the represented scene. Both Seurat and Angran's aesthetically innovative use of Comte crayon brings us to the issue of the material basis of drawings, which were vastly expanded and diversified in the 19th century. The 19th century vicissitudes of pastel, as so striking in Raphael's work, with which I began, illustrate uh, the impact of industrialized production and specifically synthetic materials. Like charcoal, pastel enjoyed a revival in the 18th century. One reason for this renewed interest of the medium uh, was the more general interest in 18th century art in France in the second half of the 19th century. Pastel was recognized as quintessentially 18th century technique. Its popularity in 18th century France was largely due to the influence of, of a brilliant Venetian pastelist, uh, Rosalba Carriera, who visited Paris in 1720. Here she is in a self-portrait with a portrait of an artist's sister of 1715. Carriera's work was received with great acclaim in the Parisian artistic circles and her visit was also a social success, granting her entry to the cultural elite and leading to friendship with several important French artists, including Watteau, whom she portrayed. The most renowned 18th century French pastelist was Maurice Quentin de la Tour, whose skill in producing likeness of uncommon veracity and sense of subjective presence, including his own on the left, uh, gained him the sobriquet of the thief of the soul, le voleur d'âme. 
Latour excelled uh, in using pastel, a demanding medium due to the dryness of the pigment hardened and, sh and shaped into a stick that made modulation of color difficult to brilliant chromatic effects illustrated by his 1751 self-portrait, one of many produced by the artist um, of unusual degree of self-esteem. Um, on the right is the original 18th century box of pastels from Latour's supplier, Jean-Nicolas um, Venezabre. As for securing the sitter's subjective presence, Latour obtained it by mastering two painterly tricks. One was the slightly elevated uh, corners of the sitter's mouth to suggest just the soupçon of a smile. Another was a place uh, to place a dot of white pigment on the iris of um, just above the pupil, as you can see here. Um, uh, that representing light uh, coming into the eye suggested the sitter's interiority. The interest in Latour was revived in the 19th century in no small measure by the writings of the Goncourt brothers who published a monograph on the artists later included in the illustrated edition of the um, uh, L'Art au XVIIIe siècle published in 12 parts in the, um, between 1854 and 75. The return um, to pastel in the 19th century was however, however also stimulated by the technological developments, namely the invention of synthetic materials that significantly expanded the, avail the available color range, introducing some yet unseen colors. I am visually evoking the new range of colors, but just a selection from a currently commercially available pastel boxes. Insofar as it, um, as it is made of powdered pigment, which implies the highest possible concentration of pigment, pastel as a medium can produce especially bright colors. But the new chromatic inventions introduced an unprecedented chromatic variety and intensity, leading to what has been described as a color revolution in the second half of the 19th century. In 1856, an Englishman, uh, Henry Perkin, invented mauve, the first commercially successful dye produced from aniline, a derivative of coal tar. Let us note how intriguing is the fact that a light color was produced originally from originally black material. Traditionally, colors and dyes were derived from plants, insect, and lichen. Mauve, by contrast, was a wholly artificial synthetic substance not found in nature. Another synthetic color obtained from coal tar, this time by the French dyers Renard Frère, was a new kind of red called uh, fuchsia or magenta in honor of the blood drenched fields of the Battle of Magenta that the French fought against the Austrian and won in 1859. I have drawn this fascinating facts from uh, Laura, uh, Laura Ann Kalba's wonderful recent book uh, color in the age of Impressionism. Later on, a whole new palette of aniline colors, including blues, greens, yellows, browns, and blacks was introduced. The artist's enthusiastic and inventive engagement with these new chromatic possibilities is wonderfully conveyed by Degas's 1879 portrait of Edmond Duarte, the art critic who championed Impressionism and Degas in particular. The artist does not merely use here new pastel colors combined here with, with gouache to produce the portrait featuring the critic in his study, but stages the medium as an agent and substance of the image. While the books on Duranty's desks, a desk are depicted in unusually vivid colors, note the especially bright crimson of the tome under his uh, arm and the citron yellow of the pamphlet cover on the extreme right edge of his desk, those on the shelf behind him appear as an array of pastel sticks in a box, among them mauve and acid green. Here is mauve and acid green and a whole range of, of reds. The portrait thus celebrates while trying to come to terms with the expanded chroma of pastels. In conclusion, what we witness uh, uh, in Raffaelli, we witness something similar in Raffaelli's later 
portrayal of an anonymous denizen of the Parisian outskirts. The vivid yellows and greens of the man's clothes do not merely describe um, his sartorial appearance, but stage pastel as a medium of new aesthetic possibilities. It is by embracing the chromatic promise of the new materials that Raffaele uh, seeks to develop a new language of the banlieue, as his friend Degas did before him for the urban domain. Raffaele sought to make place in the representation for what he described as the strangeness of Agnès. It is through new color that he asserts the existence and the difference of his unheroic, ordinary, otherwise hardly visible protagonist and of himself as uh, a draftsman. As such, this exceptional work illustrates the role of drawing supported by the new technologies and material basis, uh, the new role that drawing um, assumed in modern culture. Thank you. We went over. Thank you, Eva. We've gone just a bit over seven o'clock, but I'm going to uh, try to um, keep an eye out. I'll remind our audience that uh, the Q&A uh, option, option is available. I'm getting feedback, and I'm not sure why I call it. But the Q&A option is available, if you'd like. And if not, then I will just ask a couple of questions. I'll like to close us out. And one is, was there any mixing of media? I'm so struck, and, and thank you, by the way, for bringing that um, Raffaele drawing, uh, for explaining the modernity of it in material terms, as well as um, in, in simply what it's representing. And, and that you brought us full circle in such an interesting way. But I'm, I'm struck by how many of the artists um, we've considered, um, Seurat and Redon is another who come to mind, who who are really working in these different domains with different distinct materials and they seem to keep these aspects of their work separate. In other words, they seem to be working these different territories um, independently of each other. And we, if we think of the Grand Chat and sort of the the triumph of color, it's always surprising for people who, are, who discover the black and white um, achievement of, uh, of Seurat and Charcoal or, or Redon, another example. And so I, I guess I'm, that brings me to a question just about the, the legitimacy, even in the 19th century, of mixing drawing media or do they still remain very um, distinct and separate media that need to, be, that sort of need to have their uh, boundaries respected. And then my question follow up would be, if that's the case, is that more for reasons of practicality, just how they are applied to the paper and, and how they how they mesh together? Or were there maybe other um, more academic um, strictures on that? Well, you know, Degas is a fantastic answer to your question, because he tried to mix everything with everything on all kinds of supports. Uh, without worrying about, you know, restrictions of any kind. That's right, and um, given his printmaking. Right. So, you know, um, and he loved Raffaele. He was the one who actually introduced Raffaele, um, the Impressionist exhibitions, which caused a whole bunch of problems because Raffaele sent like 37 works of his and, um, you know, other Impressionists did not really appreciate it. But, um, yeah, so, you know, um, that, that would be my short answer, you know, that uh, they were mixed um, uh, by some artists who were daring, daring enough to do that. Um, I think that, um, you know, Seurat is, a, is another very curious example because I think he didn't mix drawing and painting, but he definitely um, developed a parallel uh, practice in drawing that was as aesthetically ambitious as his painting was. And the wonderful exhibition that Jody Hauptmann has organized at, at MoMA some years back has proven it um, uh, abundantly. Yes, The Strange New Beauty, beautiful show. So I have one question that's come in from our audience, um, which is in particular about uh, Gersin and asking if he publishes catalogs of any other artist's work 
who were not French besides Rembrandt? Did he publish any um, catalogs of foreign artists' works on paper? He wanted to, but he didn't. So yes, Rembrandt is the is the only one. But that's the you know that was of crucial importance. It was really the uh, uh, absolutely fundamental invention that you know constitutes the crux of art history as a discipline, at least until recently. And still, it is very, very useful, you know, to have a catalog written of, of an artist. Yeah, yeah. But thank you for, for this question. The point about these publications is, um, you know, is that we normally don't associate, we kind of tend to, separate, in, a, in a certain kind of traditional art history, we tend to separate uh, the academic um, you know, world um, of this of the salon or, or the public arena of the salon where art was exhibited uh, from the market. Uh, one being associated with the discourse, that of the critics and that of artistic theory, and the market being on, only about selling art. And what's really important to appreciate what has been pointed out in recent years in work on Gersin, notably was that the, mar the market generated its own important discourse, just as important discourse, the discourse of sales catalogs, as just as auction did, um, and, um, and catalog resin, et cetera. So uh, it wasn't just domain when art was sold. On the other hand, Salon was where, you know, people sent art to be seen and perhaps bought uh, and not simply appreciated by the academic jurors. Yeah, that's right. We have the sense of that as being a more modern phenomenon, but actually even at the time, and that continues to our day. I mean, uh, dealers, our dealers are, are often fonts of some of the best scholarship and knowledge. Um, it's not limited to the academic realm. So I'm, I'm scanning for um, more questions and I don't see any. So um, it's now 7.11. So I think it's left to me just to thank you so much, Professor Lyra Burkhardt, for your delicious lecture. It's just You're full welcome. of, of um, wonderful things. And I am going to just uh, invite our audience again to, um, to, to join me <laughs> in thanking uh, Ava for her remarks tonight for helping to illuminate this exhibition for us. And I encourage all of you who are able, who are in town and able to come by before next Sunday to have a look for yourselves. Um, but if not, we will we will hold to our hearts the insights and the images that you've so generally generously shared with us tonight. So thank you. And um, thank you have, as have well. A good, have a good rest of your evening. You too.